Last week, you left us halfway up the Alaska Highway, taking an aerial view of just how hard it had been to plow a 1,500-mile furrow through beautiful but awkward terrain like this. It was built back in 1942 when it was feared that Alaska and its oil fields would be attacked by forces from under the rising sun. Uncle Sam needed a supply route and it took them just eight months to build it. A lot of the guidebooks say that the road gets worse and worse the further north you get. Well, that might be the case if you're used to dawdling along an interstate at 55 miles an hour. But if you, like me, relish the notion of the open road, this is just paradise. It ducks and weaves and all the corners are banked exactly the right way. It's, it's just seventh heaven. The only problem is that round every corner, there's a new piece of wildlife. Grizzly bear, black bear, elk, caribou, even the odd wolf. It's a bit like trying to do the British Grand Prix at Longleat. However, the most common form of wildlife up here is not a big mammal. It is, in fact, the mosquito. Now, a lot of people think I'm stark staring potty for sitting inside a metal tomb on such a beautiful day as this. But let me tell you the reason. If I just lowered that window even half an inch, the car would immediately be full of airborne teeth. It may be seventh heaven for a driver, but woe betide anyone who steps outside their vehicle. The cars we were using, the Jeep Cherokee and the Ford Explorer, two of America's favorite off-roaders, will be featured in a road test later in the series. I'll tell you this, though, both of them were a sight better than the transport people used before the road came along. Remember, this was engine country. Well, this, this lake you see here used to be the one of the main means of transportation by the water to get up to Hoyters and uh, other surrounding communities. So what effect did the highway have on all this? A bit, I guess. Oh, yes. Well, they changed the whole transportation all, altogether, and they didn't have to depend on the, the waterways anymore. Like, where, where it, it helped. We used to get supplies up here by the waterways only towards the summer with the big boats from Whitehorse. This is what, 90 miles to Whitehorse? Oh, I, I would imagine it, it would be a lot more by the waterways. It used to be a five-day trip, three day, two days to go down the river and three days coming up. And how long does it take now? Two hours. Because um, right here in Teslin, there was only one car, even before the highway. The first car was brought into this to here was by my uncle back in 1928. What on earth did he drive it on? On the lake. <laughs> but it was frozen, presumably. Oh, yeah. It wasn't Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. No. <laughs> <laughs> then they built a road in the summer. They built a road about five miles on the lake shore down this way. It took them three summers to build five, five miles of road. So they built the highway through here a bit faster than that. Oh, yeah. They built a... 1,500 miles of it in eight months. So it was sort of waking up one morning and whoops, you've got a road outside your house. That's right. Odd, isn't it, how a road built at a cost of $138 million and designed specifically to keep the Japanese out is being repaired today with distinctly un-American equipment. <laughs> In its early days, the road was a simple affair, in many places just a track. But after the war, it was handed over to the Canadians, who have turned it into the glorious thoroughfare it is today. Only very occasionally, you run into stuff like this. Not only is it smooth, but also you'd have a job getting lost. Turn-offs are few and far between. But one of the most important, historically speaking, is just before Whitehorse. It's a right turn to nowhere. At this point, the Alaska Highway meets up with the Canal Highway. Now, Canal was built during the war as well, at a cost of $134 million. 
just four million less than the Big Brother. It was designed to bring oil down from way up north to a refinery they were building just down the road from here at a place called Whitehorse. Trouble was, just as they finished it, the war ended, so the whole project was scrapped. It was described later in Congress as being a junkyard monument to military stupidity. Not even the tourists use it anymore. Slightly more successful has been Whitehorse, the biggest town on the highway. It's at mile 914, but it made its name and fortune long before the road came through. Between 1896 and 1899, upwards of 30,000 hopeful miners filed through this place. Whitehorse became the very pivot of the Klondike gold industry. They built a railway from Skagway on the coast 160 miles away, but from here on up, every body, every thing, went on one of these. The gold rush itself had pretty much died down by the time ships like this made it into service. But the mines still needed to be supplied, and the only way you could do that, short of using mules, was by using beautiful stern wheelers like this. And I do mean beautiful. They even used these boats to help build the highway in 42. This one, the SS Klondike, pushed a barge full of military equipment all the way from here in Whitehorse to Fairbanks. And that's over a thousand miles away. The irony was, though, that it was digging its own grave, because pretty and characterful though these stern wheelers are, they're no match on purely economic grounds for an 18-wheeler Kenworth truck. Now, don't think that to build the highway they just installed one team in Dawson's Creek to work north and one in Fairbanks to work south. They installed teams all the way along the proposed route, some going north, some going south, some going wherever the surveyors told them to go. As a result, there was no one specific meeting place. So they chose here, Soldier's Summit, as the place for the formal opening ceremony. And they didn't choose it for the view either, because November the 20th, 1942, was the coldest, bleakest day this area has ever known. And believe you me, it's known a few. But in the summer, the most important thing is air conditioning, a commodity which, thankfully, both our cars had. It was bakingly hot, and when you reach Alaska, the only thing that drops is the price of fuel. You don't really need four-wheel drive for covering the highway now, but the big knobbly tyres you get on off-roaders are worthwhile. Even so, yesterday I managed to get myself a puncture. I wobbled along for a few miles, pulled into a filling station, the <laughs> bloke came out, spat his tobacco on the floor, looked at the tyre and he said, tyre of flat? And I really wanted to say to him, no, I was just driving around quite normally and the other three just swelled up on me. You wouldn't want to get a puncture in this. It was part of what appeared to be a rest home for the old and the weird. It looks like an old army truck, but with those wheels, there has to be more to it. 1942 Chevy, uh, ton and a half, four-wheel drive when it was built, yes. And um, did it look like this then when they built it? Uh, except for the big tires, uh, pretty much so. It probably had a, uh, a flatbed on the back when it was built. And if it's 42, that means they used it on the highway, yes? Uh, probably did. And, uh, at least it probably drove the highway in 1942 when it, when it was first opened. Because it's been here in Alaska all that time. It's in pretty good nick. Yes, pretty good shape. Things rust, don't rust much up here. We have very little humidity. You can let something set out in the woods here for many, many years, and uh, you'll get very little rust. So what do you use it for? Uh, the purpose of the big tires is we have a uh, lot of uh, 
swamp around here. We call it muskeg. It's uh, permanently permafrost, permanently frozen ground, and when it begins to thaw from the sun and that, it turns very swampy, muskeg. And uh, you need, if you want to cross this, go hunting or anything of that type, you need something with tracks or huge tires on to keep you in, on top of the swamps. And, uh, so it can swallow trucks, no problem at all? No problem at all, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have managed to avoid being eaten by either the muskeg or the mosquitoes, and with just 101 miles to go, we reached uh, the end of the Alaska Highway. Something here wasn't quite right. No, something definitely wasn't right. I have in my hand a piece of paper which certifies that Jay Clarkson, me, has gone through the trials and tribulations to reach mile 1422, the end of the Alaska Highway at Delta Junction. Now, we had been led to believe that the Alaska Highway was 1,523 miles long and that it finished at Fairbanks. 101 miles to the north of here. So why do the people of Fairbanks believe that that's the end of the Well, highway? it's not the old timers that believe it. It's mostly newcomers <laughs> that weren't here at that time. But this is where the construction of the Alaska Highway ended because the other road was already in, had been for years. So how did the people of Delta Junction feel that when Fairbanks wander in saying, hey, ours is the end? We just don't pay much attention because we know where the end of the construction was. So it's a, sort of a moot point. Nevertheless, we pressed on, and there it is, in the valley, the end, Fairbanks. The sort of place where it rains a lot and tourists celebrate the completion of their voyage by going on boat trips. To prove you've been on this genuine imitation sternwheeler, you can even buy little trinkets like this tie pin, which was made in Taiwan. In fact, as we turned south and headed for Anchorage, we couldn't help smiling at the irony. America spent a fortune protecting itself from Japan. It built a road where everyone said a road couldn't be built, specifically to keep the Japanese out. But here we are, just 50 years on, and the Japanese are just walking in. This is the seemingly all-American Dodd Stealth. It comes from the people who brought you those wonderful muscle cars, the Charger and the Challenger. Except this one is just a little bit different because it was designed in Japan, it was built in Japan, it even uses a Mitsubishi engine. It is, I'm afraid, about as American as Starkey. <laughs> 